僕自身が今建築の世界で私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私僕は建築作るというのは基本的には戦いだと。戦いにその勝利はないと。To make architecture is to make war. The only difference is that in architecture there is no victory. Victory should satisfy you, but buildings rarely do. I've never been satisfied with what I've built. Progressing or regressing in one's development really depends on the subject. To be always standing on tiptoe, concentrating, ready to make an advance, are the lessons I learned in boxing, which I use in my work as well. I'm always planning new projects before actually getting a commission. I often dream that I meet a client, design a project, and try to complete it, and then my dream ends. Or sometimes I meet a client, and when I finish explaining my design, he or she disappears, and that's when I wake up. There was an exhibition of my work in Osaka in the spring of 1987. I presented a model for a chapel on the water. Kosaku Seki, president of the Alpha Resort Tomamu, saw the exhibition and told me he wanted to have the chapel built. I was very surprised by his response. His passion, courage, and love of adventure convinced me to execute this project. We immediately went to see this beautiful and enormous landscape in Hokkaido. Together, we decided on a specific site for the chapel, which has recently been completed. When I saw this site, I was very happy and I felt privileged to be able to design a building for such a beautiful environment on the shores of Lake Shirakaba. I started to think about how to place my building in the landscape without destroying these beautiful trees, without destroying nature. The difference between my architecture and Western architecture lies in the understanding of nature. We Japanese accept nature and live in harmony with it. Western people try to protect themselves from nature. 
In my mid-30s, I first began to think of the possibility of creating an international architecture that could only be conceived by someone Japanese. When I first saw this site, I was inspired to create a large body of water, which was the image I wanted. By placing this cross and a body of flowing water, I wanted to express the idea of God as existing in one's heart and mind, rather than something that is merely presented to you by someone else. I also wanted to create a space in which one can peacefully sit and meditate. The real cross is in the water. These four crosses are meant as sculpture. They are duplicated at night by being reflected in sheets of glass that surround them. People pass through this illusionary transitional space before entering the chapel. To create a flat body of flowing water is not an easy task. Seemingly simple things, such as making water flow flat or making concrete smooth, are the most difficult qualities to achieve. For instance, it is much easier to create a waterfall. An in-depth study of the characteristics and the behavior of such elements is necessary due to the limited number of material possibilities. Each work is a challenge to create a new space, rich in potential that no one has experienced before. As a Methodist minister, I am sorry to say that there aren't many people in this country who are seriously interested in Christianity. Even though only 1% of the Japanese population is Christian, it has become very fashionable to be married in a church. The ritual is easy to understand and therefore accepted by those who decide to have their weddings there. You never really know what a building will look like until it is completed. In our generation, scientific and technical advance is so significant, especially in the West, that architecture is almost totally conditioned by it. In the next generation, I feel that the role of nature will become just as important. Seen in this light, the idea of God and nature will become somewhat different. I believe that eventually Western and Eastern thinking will overlap and open to a new world.
In a central section of Osaka, as in Kyoto and Tokyo, you can still find groups of tenement housing that have survived the war. The Tomishima House of 1972, now my office, stands on the corner on the street of tenements. After building furniture, interiors, and small houses, I opened my own office. A friend told me about a young couple named Tomishima who wanted someone to redesign their old tenement. This was my first commission. Originally, I designed this house for three, the couple and their child. The wife then became pregnant and had twins. The house was too small for five people. So, as a joke, they said it was bad planning on the architect's part and asked me to take the responsibility. We subsequently bought this house and it became my office. Since then, we have changed the building many times. I like the idea of renovating my own office because it means I'm always testing my ideas. I never went to architecture school. I studied architecture on my own by going to see actual buildings and reading books about them. I felt I could learn more if I read about the space while experiencing it at the same time. Because the ancient cities of Kyoto and Nara are nearby, there's a lot of great traditional architecture in this area. When I was about 18, I started to visit the temples, shrines and tea houses in Kyoto. I was impressed by the way the architecture was located in harmony with the surrounding nature. By sitting in this garden at the Ryoanji temple, I found an infinite tranquility. Unfortunately, I think that Japanese contemporary architecture has not incorporated the good qualities of traditional Japanese culture. Since World War II, our culture has been heavily influenced by the West. Many old and good things have been lost along the way. I'm not talking about external things, such as form or material, but a way of thinking. What interests me most is to find a way to continue these traditional Japanese concepts and values and thereby pass them on to the next generation. In an old section of Kyoto stands a three-story commercial building completed in 1984. When I first saw the site, I wondered how I could incorporate the river successfully into my design. As you can see in my drawing here, this so-called Times building actually includes the river, specifically the section between these two bridges. In Japan, gardens such as the rock garden of Ryoanji Temple are very well known. 
but I couldn't really think of an example of a traditional garden where one enjoys the view of a river. So, this new garden concept became the aim of the project. Although matter material, such as concrete, was used, I wanted to make an architecture that referred to the traditional look of Kyoto. To recreate the feeling of small streets and piazzas that one experiences in this city. I wanted to create a unity between the building and the river by eliminating a borderline between the two elements. You walk through a labyrinth-like structure where you don't know how much of it is building and how much of it is nature because you're constantly going in and out of interior and exterior spaces. I envisioned the project as an urban environment rather than a single building. So far, I have only built this one building containing fashion boutiques. At this point, I plan to expand this complex starting with a building right next to it as a gallery, and here a restaurant. Eventually, the river bank will be entirely filled with buildings, creating a complete public space. Life in Kyoto has a different pace. People in Osaka are more dynamic and active. They are full of vitality, always interested in new things, not only in terms of accepting but also creating them. Osaka people combine creativity with their talent for commerce. Here in Osaka, where I grew up, there used to be many markets like this. This is a kind of place where not only goods are exchanged, but people communicate with each other. It is sad that these markets are slowly disappearing. I like being here, listening to people actively talking to each other. The prime emphasis on economy and function have served to obscure the real aim of modern architecture. Ease of construction and efficiency have become overemphasized at the expense of spatial richness. Symbolism in architecture and ornament were both eliminated. With such a reduction, you started to really lose the enjoyment of human life. In the course of my development as an architect, I have tried to re-examine all these elements that were eliminated and bring them back into my architecture. The Aka building, completed in 1988, is in the middle of Osaka city, in a lively section where there are numerous restaurants, boutiques and department stores. 
From the exterior, it looks like a simple box, and you can't imagine what's inside. As you walk in, you are startled by changing vistas. I wanted to create a world where the interior and exterior differ completely. Views are constantly changing as you walk further inside the building. It is something you can't conceive of from the outside. I wanted to create a space that you would wish to explore so that when you come in from the entrance, you go straight forward until you reach the end of the hall. Then you go up on these stairs, so this alley-like hallway, flanked by shops, functions as a way of getting around as well as a unifying element for all the different stores. One of the main characteristics of this building is the large open vertical space, like an atrium. Most Japanese commercial architecture after the war has concerned itself with trying to pack as many stores as possible into a given space. Meaningful waste of space has been eliminated for the sake of efficiency. The balance between wasted space and efficiency is a focal point in this particular project. Here, obviously, rain comes in. In this project, I wanted to build a three-dimensional plaza. My main aim was to incorporate the outside weather in all seasons, including rain, wind, and sunshine. While designing this project, I thought of the Pantheon in Rome and Pernese's etchings of prisons. As you go down to the basement from the first floor, the changing view creates a spatial drama. You can see the image of the Piranesian labyrinth in this space. This would normally be considered wasted space and therefore eliminated. From here, you can see all the way to the sixth floor. It feels like a cave in the city. I want to bring back some of the drama that's been neglected in modern architecture. Making architecture is like riding a bicycle. Unless you continue pedaling, you stop and fall. More powerful firms go uphill on four wheels. And once they get to the top, they have enough people to keep them going automatically. But we don't have much power because we're a small firm. We need to keep pedaling without stopping. So as long as I'm pedaling away, my staff won't have any time for rest either. 
You can't fight a war on your own. You can't build a building on your own. So I demand psychological and physical strength from each member of my team. And I demand the same thing of myself. In order to build great buildings all over Japan, we are constantly fighting these wars. More than just functioning as a small group of office workers, we act as a small group of guerrillas. Each project is executed by one person from my staff and myself, working as a team of two. Thus, when there are nine projects, we have nine people on staff. Although we have several part-time students, the basic working unit is two people per project. それに付随した once we start a project, we don't have any rest until it's completed. Nine people work hard, and I also work hard on all nine projects at the same time. There are always ups and downs in architecture. Because I was successful with one project, doesn't mean my next one will be successful as well. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that it won't be as good. So you are always on the line. Make sure you are at the site whenever you need to be. If there's no one at the site, it doesn't make a good impression on the client. They might think that we are a bit strange as a team of guerrillas, but they feel that they can trust us. When a client and I have totally different views about architecture, we usually spend half a year discussing our differences. During this time, I decide whether it is possible to proceed to another stage of the project or whether to decline the commission. With seven out of ten clients, disagreements are never resolved. When our differences cannot be resolved, there's no point in continuing. Some people have said that I eat architecture in order to live, and that's why I don't get exhausted. Perhaps I do eat architecture to live. On the other hand, I feel sorry for my staff, I am sure that they are very tired by now. My husband is an architect who designs office buildings. At first, he thought that he should design our house himself. But because he was so busy at the time, and because we wanted to have the most beautiful house, my husband chose to ask Mr. Ando. From the exterior, the house is a simple structure, a basic cube surrounded by walls. 
その中に三家族がそのプライバシーを保ちながら仲良く。The interior is a bit more complicated because I had to provide a space where three different families could live together while maintaining their privacy. This extended family includes Mr. and Mrs. Kidosaki, Mr. Kidosaki's father, and Mrs. Kidosaki's mother and her younger sister. In order to allow for privacy, I placed many of the terraces on different levels. There is one on the ground floor, one on the first floor, and another on the second floor. The terraces provide the residents with a relationship to nature. Two large trees in this house are kept as a memory from the previous residence. Different rooms have different views of these trees. By sharing different views, residents share their lives as well. Here we are in one of the living rooms. Another aspect of this house is that the rooms have different spatial characteristics which create rhythmic sequences. For instance, the dining room has a low ceiling, while the living room has a very high ceiling. Anything that you can touch, such as floors and furniture, are all made from natural materials. This is within the Japanese tradition. This is another one of the living rooms. The lower half is underground. Next to this room is another dining room. By placing these rooms in different directions, I was able to create variations of light and dark spaces, a concept that has been neglected by modern architecture. Beauty is felt in traditional Japanese architecture when spaces are illuminated by small rays of light. This living room is illuminated by that same light coming in through the terrace. Gentle light casts a shadow of trees on the terrace wall. Nature is embodied in my architecture in the form of light. In this house, it is not the physical or material aspects that are interesting, but the movement of nature through space that defines the architecture. My husband's father is the owner of this house. He was born and raised in a traditional Japanese house on this site. The house was in the middle of a garden surrounded by a fence. So when he saw this box-like structure, he was so shocked that he couldn't say anything. But since we moved in two years ago, he has grown to like the house. There is something very traditionally Japanese about the way the space is treated. It is very quiet and peaceful. When I was 19, I discovered Le Corbusier by finding a book about him in a second-hand bookstore in Osaka. It was a lot of money for me at the time. While I was saving up for it, I used to check with the man at the bookshop every three days to make sure the book was still there. After I bought the book, I traced the drawings of his early period so many times that all the pages turned black. Whenever I saw something or thought about something, I always wondered how Le Corbusier would have thought about the same thing. If Le Corbusier had a chance to see my architecture, he probably would have told me to be more free. I think my architecture is quite restricted, 
because I try to create freedom through confinement. I was born in Osaka in 1942. Six months later, World War II began. By the end of the war, there was little left of Osaka. I was the eldest of twin boys, and because it was decided that my maternal grandmother was to raise me, I was given her name, Ando. My grandmother had become a successful merchant before the war, and her strong values influenced me a great deal. Our first home was near the port of Osaka. Later, we moved to another part of the city where I live to this day. Doing well in school was never that important to my grandmother. She gave me the freedom to do things on my own. I was not a good student. I did not listen to my teachers. I always preferred learning things on my own, outside of the classroom. A master at the carpentry shop across the street showed me how to make things. He taught me how to carefully examine each step of a process, first studying the materials, and then collecting the right tools. So, at an early age, I learned to consider all possibilities before starting a project. I never worked for another architect. Whenever I tried, I was fired within three days because of my stubbornness and temper. My first attempts at designing consisted of small wooden houses, interiors, and furniture. It was during the development of these small-scale projects that I began to experiment with and formulate my ideas. In the 1960s, I made several trips to Europe and America to learn more about the architecture of the West. These trips were all important to me. Today, I still travel to look at architecture. Here, I find myself at Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water in Pennsylvania. Being here makes me realize the importance of an architect's imagination in citing a building. This house is situated in harmony with nature, incorporating the waterfall and the surrounding landscape. In this work, nature and architecture interact so effectively that it seems as if nature and architecture are conversing with each other. It's like having a river in your home. When I was 17, I went to Tokyo for the first time and saw Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel. I had never heard of Frank Lloyd Wright and didn't know anything about the hotel, but the power of fascination and attraction has little to do with intellectual knowledge. The Imperial Hotel was one of those buildings that fascinated me and my curiosity took me inside. The building had a very strong and mysterious power. I felt something very Japanese in the architecture. Since then, I have read that Wright was influenced by The Book of Tea by Tenshin Okakura, and this interested me very much. Wright learned the most important aspect of architecture, namely the treatment of space, from Japanese architecture.
まあ、それについて興味がありまして、僕はそれで。At the Imperial Hotel, I remember a dark, narrow corridor with an extremely low ceiling leading into a huge hall. It was like walking through a cave. That same sensibility of space is here at Falling Water. In contrast to what modern architecture sought, a juxtaposition of a series of uniform spaces. Wright introduces a series of spaces that are all quite different from one another. The unity between nature and architecture is achieved here, so that it is like walking through a cave. This is what I felt at the Imperial Hotel, too. The difference here at Falling Water is that the elements that I discovered at the Imperial Hotel. Are mixed with the natural sound of birds, water, and wind, and this appeals to me as an entity. Japanese architecture relies very much on craftsmen and carpenters. You learn architecture with your body. You draw your working drawings and build while making changes at the site. Craftsmanship is the essence of Japanese architecture. Here will be a dome with exactly the same dimensions of the Pantheon. It will be made of glass blocks supported by numerous columns. It will mainly serve as a lobby. But will also function as an arena for fashion shows. On my first trip to Europe, I went to see Le Corbusier's Unité d'habitation in Marseille. I was very intrigued by his dynamic use of concrete. It was very rough. My concrete construction does not involve any special techniques. Its color and texture depend on the quality of cement and the balance of sand and pebbles. I prefer hard concrete because of its strength. However, this is difficult to achieve. The quality of the concrete construction does not depend so much on the concrete mix itself, but rather on the wooden formwork in which the concrete is cast. In Japan, because of the tradition of wooden architecture, the craft level of carpentry is rather high. The construction of wooden formwork, where not a drop of water will escape from the corners and seams, depends upon this high quality of Japanese craftsmanship. Quality concrete depends upon sufficient consolidation and watertight formwork. Otherwise, holes will appear and the surface will crack and disintegrate. I really like the texture of concrete, but concrete is not part of the Japanese traditional sensibility. Japanese houses are built with wood and paper. It is a very sensitive and gentle architecture. If you're used to Japanese architecture, A space built with stone and concrete seems totally foreign. My attitude towards concrete is to look for a kind of concrete that is closer in feeling to wood and paper, to find a beautiful and sensuous concrete. At the Koshino residence, I was trying to approach the concrete with the same sensibility as one approaches wood and paper. This residence is located in Ashia, a fashionable suburb of Osaka. Because it's adjacent to a national park, it is surrounded by beautiful trees. Since the site is so beautiful, I designed the building so as not to disturb the surroundings. From the outside, it looks small, but on the inside, it is quite large. From the outside, it looks as though it has only one story, but on the inside, you will find two stories. One aspect of my design was to situate the house on the slope. 
まず1階から入ってほとんどこうだんだん you enter on the first floor and go down these stairs to the living room the kitchen and dining area below まあ、こういうふうに見ていただいたらその外からこんな大きなスペースがこの中に1つあるのでこの2つのスペースがこの中にあるので1層分はその地中にうまく見込められておりますからその中に入るとその2層分のその空間がここに展開するわけですでこの腰の弘子さんというのはファッションデザイナーですからこの中にあるとその2層分のその空間がここに展開するわけですでこの腰の弘子さんというのはファッションデザイナーですからこの中にあるとその2層分のその空間がここに展開するわけですでこの腰の弘子さんというのはファッションデザイナーですからこの中にあるとその2層分のその空間がここに展開するわけです At the same time, it is used as her private living room. Direct sunlight passes across this wall through slots led into the ceiling. Here, I was influenced by the way that light is used in Western architecture. At the Koshino residence, the light in the space has two different qualities. The gentle light that appears on the side walls in the atelier, and the straight and dynamic light that penetrates in the cubic living room. This dynamic light is rare in Japanese architecture. If Yoko Koshino wants to go to her atelier, she'll go through this passage, allowing her to look at green on both sides. Here we are entering the atelier, and light doesn't strike the wall directly, but enters indirectly through another overhead slot. Although this space is mostly underground, you can still have a view of the sloping lawn outside. From the outside, the house looks like two simple boxes, but when you go inside, it's very complicated, like a labyrinth. Here, I'm going through an underground passage connecting the living room to the bedroom wing. The house is designed so as to combine darkness and brightness with high and low ceilings in order to create the rhythm. If one lets light into architecture in many different and subtle ways, one can enjoy light watching. My clients often want to know if I also live in a concrete house. When I say that I actually live in a wooden house, they are very surprised. I have lived in this tenement since I was a child. Some years ago, I added an upstairs space. Environmental atmosphere is very important to me. I am like an animal in a way. My instinct is to come home. Coming home means coming back here. It is like my cave. It would be nice to have a more spacious and beautiful house, but it just wouldn't be the same. In a way, my spirit will always be here. My body wants to come home to my soul. Although this house doesn't get much light, I feel tremendous comfort here. If there are two types of comfort, namely physical and spiritual, spiritual comfort can be sought in darkness and physical comfort in light. But I need both kinds of comfort. I believe that darkness enriches your soul. I am sorry that modern architecture has eliminated this aspect. We started construction on the first part of Rocco housing in 1978. One of the main characteristics of this project is its location on a 60 degree slope in a suburb of Kobe. I wanted my architecture to enhance the beauty of the surrounding nature.
Of all my projects, Rocco housing represents some of my ideas most clearly. It is a combination of 20 simple 18 by 18 foot structural bays. Despite this repetitive module, each apartment layout is unique. I have tried to reinsert certain concepts which were forgotten by the modernists, such as a concern for the attributes of a given place or region, and the need to maintain two entirely different concepts at the same time. Universal technology on the one hand, and the peculiarities of a particular site on the other. While the 20 units seem the same on the outside, Within, they are completely different. From the exterior, the entire structure seems to be embedded into the slope of the hill, as if it were destroying the surrounding nature. Once you're within the complex, nature enters at the size of the central piazza, which is situated at the midpoint of the inclined stairway. This space also attempts to combine the traditional western square with the narrow street space of the Japanese town. I think that this is one of my most important works. We are now working on Rocco Housing Part 2. My main intention is to develop certain ideas that were inhibited by the more formal concerns in the original Rocco Housing. The adoption of an open frame rather than cross-wall construction liberates the planning of the internal spaces. There will be 50 units altogether. The scale is four times larger than Rocco 1. A large green is planned for the space between the two sections of the Rocco housing. This is to be shared by all the residents. We will also build a long stairway outside. The elevator runs underneath these stairs. On a nice day, the stairs provide not only a beautiful view, but also healthy exercise. As in all my projects, my concern goes beyond the building itself to a consideration of the surrounding landscape. I've always been interested in how architecture and the environment enhance each other. I have been fortunate in being able to observe how Rocco housing has interacted over the years with its immediate environment. Now that we get many large commissions, I like spending some time making changes in my office. This small-scale work is very important to me, especially when I am consumed by larger projects. My inclination towards smaller projects perhaps comes from my experience of knowing the joy of intimately working on a small scale. It helps me clarify my ideas. In this instance, we rented a small wooden house of about 350 square feet, close to this office, and built a tea house within it. Tea houses usually require the best quality building materials, in terms of wood, paper, and so forth. But I was more interested in building a modern tea house using unorthodox materials. My main intention was to create a small but interesting space, 
the kind of space that you've never experienced before. Eventually, I would like to make a tea house underground, covered with earth. When I'm 55, I think I will have reached my creative peak in terms of physical energy. After that, I would like to gradually decrease the scale of my projects. If one's creative life ends in the mid-70s, at that time I would like to go back to designing smaller houses, just like my first project. I'd like to keep the momentum going of my basic ideas that were expressed in those early projects. I'd like to create space that provides a balance for one's physical comfort and spiritual enrichment. As I said before, we are creating an army of guerrillas. Guerrillas always face destruction in the end, like the kamikaze in World War II. In our case, we will continue fighting until all our guerrillas are destroyed. We will continue to fight, physically and psychologically, without stopping. Continuation means to make progress. While making progress, we will naturally encounter a barrier and one of us might be blown to pieces. When all our guerrillas have fallen, we will close our office. Destruction is also a condition of creation.